Welcome to the podcast of the Robustly Beneficial AI Group in Lausanne, Switzerland. This week, we will, dis- we will discuss emotional contagion through a paper that was published in 2013 by researchers from Facebook and Cornell. Yeah, so that was a very that, that's a very important paper, I think, that it got a lot of attention, but also a lot of controversy behind uh, this paper. Yeah, so you want to present it? Yep, so the title of the paper is a. Uh, Experimental evidence of massive scale emotional contagion through social networks. And so, what they did is uh, they decrease or increase the, no, not increase, they, they decrease either the, the, the quantity of uh, positive messages that people see in their newsfeed on Facebook or of negative messages. So, it was quite, it, it's quite long ago. So, to detect positive and negative messages, they they used uh, specific keywords and messages with positive keywords were classified as positive and with negative keywords as negative. And then they see that when, uh, when inside your feed you see less positive messages, it will make you post also less positive, uh, make less positive post. And if you see less negative messages, you will also post less uh, negative messages. You will make less negative post. So that's what they call an emotional contagion. Like, we are contaminated by the emotion that we, that we feel on us. This was already some uh, phenomena that was quite well known in, uh, in real life uh, scenarios and that was very well studied, but people were doubting that through social network where we just interact with lines of text, we would also have these kind of effects. And uh, with this experiment, they, they showed it. Yeah, so it's interesting, interest, interesting that the, the paper was framed as a, a psychology paper, like they were discussing this psychological uh, hypothesis mm-hmm. and, and how this paper is a contribution to this uh, body of work, and it, it is, and it's uh, interesting. Uh, to me, that's not the most interesting part of this uh, paper, like uh, if I were to rewrite it, uh, not necessarily to be published, but in a way that's most compelling, like the, the main takeaway, uh, like I would phrase it more like in terms of uh, that, like how much can you do by tweaking uh, recommender algorithms? Mm-hmm. Maybe before we, we go to the what, what, like this kind of aspects, maybe just some basics for those who didn't read the paper. It's worth noting that this sample size, yeah. the number of people who were um, involved or rather used in this experiment is 680,000. So yeah, close to three, quarter, three quarters of a million or two, two, at least two, more than half a, half a million. So it's a, it's a really massive number. So it is a bit far, fra, far from the, the orders of magnitude that people were used to in uh, massive psychological experiments. And back then, so uh, remember very, very well when the paper was published in 2014. So the work was done in 2013. Something also to keep in mind is that the algorithmic tools that were used in the work are now seven years old, so probably very, very basic. Yeah. Facebook didn't have the, the machine learning and AI capabilities it has today. There was, no, there was no Facebook AI research team. There was barely any academic uh, machine learning research happening then in Facebook. Yes. Uh, there, there was some data scientists, like uh, the, main co- the main author of the paper, but, uh, but we have to put this in context, that this was done you know, with very basic tools back then. But still, uh, the experiment was impressive for some worrying with its scale and, yeah. uh, and, and what it showed back then. Yeah, I suggest we discuss more the, the results and the interpretations of the results. And then we can move on to the controversies because they are extremely interesting. Well, I was not going to the controversy first, yeah. just like the basics, the number of people uh, in the experiment, the, fi- the key findings and the tools that were used back then. Yeah. And uh, the, so if you look at the, the results, uh, so as you said, like they, they observed like, uh, modifications of what people posted mm-hmm. after uh, the treatment. So the treatment being you, you see less positive contents or you see less negative contents. Uh, but uh, so it's like statistically uh, significant, uh, significant uh, in terms of the p value. But the the effect size is quite small. Right? That's something that's quite uh, noteworthy. Yeah, it was between one and percent and zero point one percent. Yeah, uh, but having but given the experimental setup, um, like I'm maybe I'm framing this a bit as a patient question, but. Uh, uh, you probably shouldn't. You like it was weird to expect a lot of huge impact, because all they did was just to remove ten mm-hmm. percent 
of one kind of content. So like 10% of all the positive of the posts with positive words, or 10% of uh, the posts with negative words. Yeah. So this like is really like a very small trick. Uh, so you should not expect a huge, uh, huge uh, effect sizes, but mm -hmm. you do observe effect sizes, which is already quite impressive. And the other thing is that the experiment lasted one week. So it's like the effect of this treatment after one week. And um, actually next week we're going to discuss uh, things that are about like uh, modifications of human uh, behaviors after several weeks. Uh, <laughs> uh, so one week is actually quite small like in, in terms of uh, human cognition and the changes of, of behaviors. And so in the end, like even though the effect sizes were quite small, you have to, to take also into account that the, the experimental set setup the, was also quite limited and it's already quite impressive that you see such, uh, such an effect. Uh, wow. Yes, and uh, also this small effect size, given the size of the, of the social network, if there is 1 billion users, 0.1% yeah. uh, change means that it changes how 1 million users would behave, which is extremely significant. Yeah. Like another thing that was discussed in the paper is the fact that it was not only mimicry. Like you, you could imagine like just people were replicating the emotions that were uh, mm -hmm. given. But uh, the, the, uh, the, there's one subtlety is that uh, like if, you, if they only did that, then you would expect that people who see, uh, some, for instance, less negative uh, posts would post only less negative, uh, would also post less negative posts. But you may not expect them to post also more positive mm -hmm. Good uh, point, content, yeah. and so so that was discussed. Like it's also like people are actually being more positive by uh, being exposed to less negative content, which was uh, like insight into the fact that it's not just mimicry. Yeah, and that was very interesting. Yeah, so this paper, uh, like like I often use it to, to show that. Uh, Algorithms have an impact, they have a huge impact. So sometimes it's uh, even debated, like people sometimes argue, yeah, in the end it's the humans that, uh, that we share the content, and that's true, humans play a big part. But this kind of paper, I think, really shows that, especially in social networks where you have curation by some algorithm, uh, the algorithm plays a critical role on what people feel, and uh, maybe that's an extrapolation from this paper, but probably it also has a huge impact on what people believe and what people actually do in their daily practices. Yeah, I was thinking that uh, I would be really interested to know when, uh, let's say, we would do the same experiment on, on YouTube where for some we would remove some of the content that is uh, quality information and for other users we would remove the content that is uh, false information or low quality information and, and then later on ask them about their belief. So. I, I, I don't know what this study would, would, would give, but I expect that it would be even more than a, yeah. an even larger effect than for emotions. Yeah, and uh, just to take examples from the book uh, that, that Mindy and I wrote, uh, like you can imagine that if the YouTube algorithm stops recommend, uh, recommending uh, anti-vaccination videos, mm -hmm. you could have a huge impact of this small tweak in the algorithm on global health uh, and issues uh, related to vaccinations. Um, like for instance, the World Health Organization reported that uh, I think it was around 100,000 people died because of measles, uh, which mm -hmm. is a disease for which there is a, a vaccine. Um, and so you can have a huge impacts by tweaking these algorithms, but you have to do it in a robustly beneficial way, uh, which mm -hmm. is not always easy, but there, there's something to be done here. Yeah. Another interesting point that is uh, good to, to look at in the paper was that they so they had a control a control group where they, they, they remove at random messages, not specifically removing messages with emotions. And they found out that the groups for which messages with with more emotions were, were removed ended up interacting less with the platform. So they, they saw a difference and even in one case there was a difference of uh, up to 3% difference yeah. of the interaction with the platform. And this, this goes back to other things we have discussed about AI safety, such as uh, polarization, the fact that people interact more with, uh, with comments that are more charged with emotion, such as anger, but also very strong happiness that makes people engage more with the platform. And we deduce from that that if when algorithms try to 
find statistical pattern in how to do recommendation, it would find that recommending these kind of messages, this kind of post is uh, is worth it and is doing it. So if we let the algorithms get smarter and uh, continue to recommend based on um, any metric of engagement, then this is what we should expect to happen. Yeah, and this is interesting um, and important in terms of like, uh, if you want to impose ethics on, on algorithms, uh, then th there may be a cost involved for the company. There's probably going to be a cost involved mm -hmm. for, for the company. Um, and you can, and it's much easier to, and to encourage companies to implement uh, some ethical values in their algorithm if you can show that, uh, or strongly suggest that, that uh, these ethical values will not be too harmful for, for instance, the use of the, the, the platform. So typically this result, particular result, would suggest that if you want to encourage companies to put ethical values in, in their algorithm, uh, probably suggesting them to have purely like no emotion uh, content would not be a very good idea because mm -hmm. it's very bad for, for, for the company. Yes. Uh, whereas if you try to, 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 to argue that by uh, promoting more happy content, uh, engaging but with positive emotions, then uh, maybe the companies will, will see that it's not that harmful to it and can actually be, be beneficial for the company uh, in terms of uh, like the reputation of the company or in terms of users' appreciation of, of uh, the platform. And, uh, I, and overall, I think this is a, a key element to take into account when you're designing, when you're proposing ideas to, to put ethics in, into these algorithms. Yeah, but I, I'm not very confident that this would, this would be efficient. I think even suggesting to, to promote more happy content, I think it, we can expect it to hurt uh, the business a lot because uh, things like uh, fear or anger has been shown to propagate much more and get much more engagement. Like just recently, we see that there are uh, a whole uh, contagion of fake news uh, about the coronavirus that's that are going on, and they they play they just play on the fear of uh, people online that because they're afraid would click and read these articles. Yeah. Aren't there topics on which we could reach easy agreements that say topic A should be propagated a bit more, topic B shouldn't be propagated I, I, as much? I think this this is we could easily agree on that, but. It would also be a result that it would hurt the business. There would be less people watching YouTube or less people scrolling on Facebook. So you yeah. have business side effects, but you <coughs> don't even have side effects for the in intentional purpose you had initially. Yeah. You might want to decrease the propagation of topic B and then end up having worse than B appearing. Yeah, uh, there's another paper maybe we can discuss uh, for another session that uh, that studied a bit this, like what well, are a few other papers, mm -hmm. like what are the, the what are the emotions that uh, create the, the most uh, amount of engagement, and uh, yeah, like fear and anger or like uh, mm -hmm. top in this list, but actually happiness is quite uh, is quite good as well in this list. Um, so, it, well, I think it's interesting to investigate uh, all, all of right. these things. Um, and maybe it's also like, well, it's like clearly also very contextual. It depends a lot on the particular person. It depends also probably on the overall mood of the platform. Like especially like the coronavirus, like you have a piling up of this fear. And uh, mm -hmm. so people are already within this, uh, this emotion. And I think emotions are very addictive in a sense. Like when you're angry, you, you, you want to stay angry in a sense. Like you're shouting at others and if they're not angry, upsets you if they get angry it also like makes you even more angry uh, so yeah i think it's a, also an interesting research in terms of psychology to know like yeah how, how much people value these, these different things and how to deal with uh, this kind of addiction to certain emotions and uh, getting people to reflect on whether this is really beneficial to be in this state of emotion mm -hmm. uh, i'm not saying it isn't useful to be uh, uh, angry maybe sometimes it, it, it is useful to be angry to, to to provoke a change or, or, or because, uh, but yeah, a better understanding of, of, of the effects of, of these different emotions, I think, is very relevant actually to, to making algorithms uh, more robustly beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. Another interesting uh, point that at the time the paper came out, it, it was very uh, polemical. Okay. And 
And the, one of the reasons was people saying that this is not an ethical experiment. Yeah, so that was a, one of the big controversies. Uh, uh, I think it's worth uh, discussing it uh, at length. Um, because the size of the experiment is extremely unusual, as you said, uh, for, for psychologists. Like usually psychology uh, you don't have that many, uh, that, that many subjects. And so you, you, like just doing the experiment feels like you already have a global impact on, on so many people. And, and, and in a sense, it can be harmful to the subjects. Uh, especially, uh, there's this other problem, which is like, did people really give their consent mm -hmm. to, to, to participate uh, in, in this experiment? Um, so technically, it was written at some point in the paper that uh, well, it's part of what you sign when you sign the, uh, the, the agreements on, on Facebook. Yes. Um, but yeah, there's this debate, like, is it actual consent to sign this? Because, well, who reads <laughs> <laughs> this, this kind of agreement? And the other thing is about the uh, opting out, like usually uh, one of ethical, one ethical rules, rule of uh, psychological experiments is that people can opt out whenever they, they want. Yeah. And here it was not even clear that they, they could opt out, they were not even aware of this. So yeah, these were like a few discussion points. A lot of the, yeah, I think people are, don't like this, uh, this kind of experiment because somehow when deciding to show more negative content to users, we have we see that some this kind of user also posted slightly more negative uh, status updates, like so maybe ten thousand users changed their yeah. status updates. And this somehow did we hurt these ten thousand uh, people? And in the other hand, on the side when we were showing more less negative comment and more positive, did we create a large amount of good to this? Uh, more than 100,000 users that were slightly more happy yeah. in their life because they were able to see this kind of message. And then it raises, so some people do the mistake of thinking that the right ethical thing to do is to not do experiment and change nothing, keep the algorithm the way it is. But then uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't buy this. And uh, I, I find that if we, if, we are, if we think that one solution is much better than another to make people feel happy, then uh, I, I would really want that the algorithm goes for this kind of uh, solution. Yeah. Maybe just to give a precision <coughs> of what you just said, like, uh, uh, the experiment did not involve showing more negative content to people. Mm -hmm. It was only the removal of some kind of... Yes, yes, sorry. Yeah. It's only a small fraction. So, uh, yeah. so there was a, a, probably a lot of thoughts that went into this uh, uh, when they prepared the, the experiment. But yeah, it's definitely something worth uh, wondering about like, like, because they did choose to remove 10% of positive content in the newsfeed for some users and this actually created uh, those users to uh, write more negative stuff so putting them in the probably worse uh, mental mm -hmm. health condition um, during the experiment so is that uh, justified? I think this is a difficult question uh, but you have to compare it with the, the gain you get by learning this information about this, uh, this experiment. Um, I think this experiment gave us a lot of insights into what uh, can happen, at least, on, on social medias. Um, does this insight, uh, is this insight uh, more valuable than uh, ha harming? And uh, like when I say harming, I, I should insist on don't harm them a lot. Like, uh, <laughs> like it wasn't like torture. <laughs> <or anything>. like, <laughs> uh, as we, as we said, the effect size was the effect sizes were very small. Um, now the question is, like, were they going to be much bigger? Would they have stopped the experiment? Like, that would be an interesting question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it seems like the the harm that you cause here is very very small. But the insight you get is quite quite big and interesting. I, I, I would argue, like, if you assume. Um, yeah, and and also this is the harm that is done by this kind of experiment when you are in the wrong. Uh, uh, condition of the experiment. It's very similar to the arm that is done by having the social network used by one billion people yeah. every single day. And it's, it's not, it doesn't make a big difference, but uh, as you say, the insight we learned from doing this experiment that the slope is uh, positive. If we, sh if we show less negative uh, things, then the, the user will by themselves post more positive uh, emotions. That's very in interesting to, to know. And uh, yeah, the key point of this that 
not mentioned in the paper, but what we what we hear from it is that yes, these social networks have a huge impact on our emotion and can uh, really change yeah. the way we behave. Yeah, yeah, and th and then there's this. Uh, I guess other question is like, should you do now? What should you do now? now that you have this information? Like, should you actually go forth and change the algorithm for the better? Mm -hmm. um, and what, which I guess is still another question. Like, from uh, is going is Facebook actually going to do this? Because we like if this is what we want them to be doing, we also need to make sure that they will be doing this, which is also another problem. Um, like, like, like I feel like uh, given the power of this algorithm, we need to make real, to, 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 to make sure that they are going to be robustly beneficial. And uh, maybe an observation that we need to start with is that they are not robustly beneficial, at least not all the, all the time right now. And the status quo setting here uh, is, is improvable, <laughs> I'd say, at least. And uh, like, well, I guess that, that's what we, why we're doing this podcast. Is that we think that these algorithms should be improved and should be made more robustly beneficial. But it's also very hard to make them robustly beneficial. And you need more insights to understand what ought to be done, what, was the, what is the priority, for instance, in terms of ethics, uh, to be done for, for algorithms to be more robustly beneficial. Um, and also, I think the, 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 the idea of prioritization, which is uh, an important one uh, in effective algorithm, like trying to find what are the, what are the ethical problems with algorithms that are uh, most important to, to tackle right now is, mm -hmm. is extremely important. And maybe there's not enough thought about this prioritization. And this probably also has to do with we don't have sufficient insights into what the impacts of the algorithms are. Yeah. And so this kind of paper is actually, I'd say, very really critical to show that, yeah, yeah, there are problems, for instance, with uh, data privacy, and these are really important as well. But I feel like these kind of impacts, which mm -hmm. are large scales, are, are, are extremely strong and maybe neglected compared to other concerns that, that we may have for, for algorithms. So you would be happy to see more experiment of the type run yes. on uh, other big platforms? Yeah, so, so that's uh, the, the, I guess, uh, the big question that, uh, because what the controversy at that time uh, led to was essentially uh, companies, uh, well, companies stopped doing this kind of, uh, I keep, or rather, they stopped uh, making public this kind of uh, research because mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I, I'm pretty sure I could bet easily that they're still doing Things that are much worse than this experiment in practice. Uh, they probably are doing a lot of A-B testing and seeing people's reactions and, and probably they're testing more for user engagement than uh, beneficial impacts. Uh, uh, yeah. So clearly they have a lot of insights into these uh, the impacts of the algorithms that from the outside is for us very hard to, to, to have. Uh, so we definitely encourage them to make them more public, uh, <laughs> at least what they are already doing. Yeah. Uh, and it's a bit of a shame, I, I'd say, because uh, I, I feel like because of the controversy, um, while such information was no longer made public, uh, and we have less insight than we could have into uh, what these algorithms uh, are doing and what is the impact of these algorithms. Yeah, it's, uh, it sounds a bit similar to what we discussed uh, two, two weeks ago about uh, uh, algorithmic and accountability and uh, and studying uh, black boxes. So here, if if such company do experiments to to measure metrics like uh, user engagement or whether user users are happy or not, yeah, it's it, and it's sad that today they do it in a not transparent way that we don't know what they are trying to do and no one here is able to sufficiently study the recommendations of YouTube because it's black box that we can't inquire. So yeah, yeah it would be really amazing if they make at least part of this uh, transparent and accessible to, to us by publication or just opening opening more APIs to to be able to study the recommender systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it has to do uh, whether they're going to do it or not, has to do with the incentives that we give them. And uh, I feel like, unfortunately, the backlash that occurred uh, mm -hmm. because of the, after the publication of this paper, like a lot of people complain about the ethical grounds of the of the experiment, and uh, I agree the experimental grounds are, are, are disputable. Yeah. But by it's like um, I don't know where 
I, I, I heard this, but I think it was in Jurgat or something, that, that says that uh, whenever your mother calls you and blames you for, no, whenever you call your mother and your mother blames you for not calling her enough, she's <laughs> actually so, doing something very counterproductive for her girl. Like, yeah. Uh, I feel like it's the same thing, like uh, Facebook released something publicly, like they got blamed for this, well, they're not going to release anything publicly anymore. <laughs> uh, so, of course, we have uh, these strong beliefs and we want to express them, but I think it's important as well, as well to think about the implications of uh, making these uh, concerns too virulent, too, 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 uh, yeah, too, too violent, too, yeah. too feel good. Yeah, um, but yeah, I, I, I do feel like there should be more studies uh, about this, but this may be very controversial. Uh, because I, I think these social networks are getting more and more complex and the impact of the, of the algorithms are more and more complex because they are more and more personal, personalized, uh, they are fed with more and more data and they have more and more clever, sophisticated algorithms that are used to analyze uh, and to do recommendations. Um, and it's a, back, it's a very black box uh, so far. Uh, at least, at least medium black box, <laughs> to use the terminology we introduced uh, two weeks ago, uh, from out, for outsiders. But I feel it's also a black box for, like, it's very dark box uh, for insiders as well. Like, I'm not sure YouTube, how much YouTube understands what the YouTube algorithm is doing because the YouTube environment is very, very complex. And if you don't give yourself the resources and the, the, to, to do these kinds of experiments, uh, then it's like having your head buried in the sand and you just move along and you're just blind to all the possible side effects that your algorithms have. And I don't find it robustly beneficial. Yeah, and then uh, <laughs> also people continue to, to think that this recommended system have a small impact on, uh, on our social life, but they actually have a very strong one. Yeah. Uh, maybe another thing we can discuss is uh, about um, uh, the the... The, the fact that this experiment so had impacts, negative impacts on, on, on some of the, the subjects of the experiments, which is something that's undesirable, but that uh, unfortunately often happens in, in psychology experiments in, in general. Um, and the approach that was used in this paper was a very uh, classical or statistical test uh, approach, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that you first choose a sample size uh, here and was very large, <laughs> uh, and then uh, run the experiments on all other subjects, and you have to go all the way through the experiment and then analyze the results. This is like the very classical uh, setting of classical uh, uh, hypothesis uh, statistical mm -hmm. testing, and uh, uh, and uh, well, and you can see this as uh, well. It's dangerous. Like, uh, like if the treatment was much more harmful than it actually was. Uh, it would have been the, the experiment itself would have been causing a, a lot of harms, and that's really not uh, beneficial. So, uh, what instead a lot of people have been uh, proposing was to have more uh, different kind of uh, testing approaches, uh, like for instance, based on multi armed bandit. Mm -hmm. So, the problem of multi armed bandit um, applied, for instance, to, to medical uh, drugs, uh, like the eff efficacy of uh, medical drugs. Uh, in this setting, what you're doing is you have uh, subjects coming in, and for each subjects, you, you still choose randomly either to give him uh, the drug or a placebo. And, uh, uh, and, and then you go to the next one, and so on. But the trick of, uh, of many multi arm bandit uh, protocols is that uh, you're going to change the probability of giving the treatment to a new uh, subject, depending on the performance of the, uh, the drug on the previously tested uh, uh, subjects. So that if the drug is starting to kill people, mm -hmm. which is not good, you should decrease very quickly the probability of giving the, the drug. And you can actually prove, prove guarantees, so it's a very classical setting uh, to do this. And uh, more generally, this is the problem of safe uh, exploration. Um, so the problem of uh, safe expression is that uh, we, want, we have this very complex system, say uh, social uh, medias, and you don't fully understand uh, the effect of different treatments on, on this system or different actions in general. Yeah. Uh, and so you need to understand it better. So that's the exploration phase. Mm -hmm. But exploration can have a cost. 
Uh, and so if you find one solution, it's also, it seems so tempting to do uh, what's so-called uh, exploitation, uh, meaning that you just do what you think is best, not what you think will let you acquire more information. Um, and this is like uh, very discussed and it's a very uh, interesting problem and so one of the most fundamental problems I, th I think in, uh, in decision making in general and applied here to ethical problems. Um, so I guess what I would like to see if there are such studies, well, as such studies are done by companies and hopefully, well, hopefully uh, according to me, uh, published in the future is approaches that are more along these lines. Um, I think in the case of Facebook, when they did the experiment, they just cared about getting, gaining the information, and that's why they they had this uh, perfectly balanced sample of uh, as many participants on the negative condition, as many participants in the positive condition, as many participants in the control condition. So, but if they, on top of caring about gaining as much information as possible, if they also found it very important that uh, <coughs> there are less uh, negative messages. That's what they, so that means that throughout the, the experiment, as they, as they learn more and more that uh, the negative condition leads to more negative messages, they would change the way they handle participants and, and change, them with the con change their condition for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is also valuable from a business point of view if you replace ethical values by uh, profit yeah. or user engagement as uh, they're supposed to be mm -hmm. maximizing. Um, if you just want to know more and you just want this big experiment, well, th this re just running the experiment is going to have a cost on profits or, or user engagement or whatever. And so you don't want to, when you want to make sure this is not going to be too costly, but you cannot do it ahead of time. So you can learn this as you go. And uh, if you quickly discover that one action is actually very harmful uh, to your business, or yeah. let's talk more for ethics, <laughs> uh, then you should stop doing this. Essentially. Yeah, and if there is a, if you measure a large effect, you will need very few examples of this large effect to, to be able to make a right decision. But when in case where the effect is very small, like maybe in the case of the Facebook Facebook study, yeah. then it's a case where you you would still need a lot of participants. Yeah. To, to detect it. Yeah. Yeah, I think one difficult thing about doing uh, these uh, ethical reasonings is that uh, the effect size really matter. Like you have to put numbers into uh, these things and to say, well, this is not too harmful, but insightful, so we should do this. And, and this like is mm -hmm. very, very hard to do. Like, uh, like I totally understand that people feel like this is something we should not do. Uh, but I do feel like in the end, this is something, if you want to make algorithms robustly beneficial, especially in the long run, we, we, we need to have this kind of thinking uh, between weighing different things and doing so quantitatively it is, is uh, I think, the, uh, an important way to go. Though I understand that this may be controversial. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe you wanted to bring the, the, the question of public health. So what this experiment yeah. teaches us is that uh, though people are sometimes in denial of the impact of platforms on people's mental health, like mm -hmm. not now less and less in denial, but we tended to, to hear a lot of denial in the real impact of, of, of platforms and what they recommend to users. What this ex experience shows us is that you can have a significant impact with, with relatively mm -hmm. small experience given the size of Facebook. Now, because of the backlash, the ex these kind of experiments are not reported anymore, or at least like Facebook apologized and stopped uh, publicizing these kind of experiments. And uh, like in the opposite, for, for the purpose of public health and public mental health, we actually need uh, to have some oversight in the kind of routine A-B testing that is ongoing, because who, who knows what kind of impact you're you are, you are going to have with just uh, what seems to be innocent A-B testing, just testing this versus like A versus B and then looking mm -hmm. at the, what, what, what the user engagement be. Uh, recently, there have been calls by um, Sundar Pichai, the CEO of uh, Alphabet, uh, so the Google, uh, for actually more regulation. So, so now we even have people from these platforms 
telling the public authorities, please regulate. <laughs> well, this, this is a bit stretched, but uh, yeah. we are almost there. Like, please regulate us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think it's like uh, it's, it's time to think about so about what could what could public health authorities bring. Yeah. And actually, they should they should be involved in in the routine testing that is ongoing because we don't know what the impact would be on people's health and. Uh, yeah. And the, the the larger effects. So maybe also like that's one of the unfortunate consequences of the of this experiment and the way it was done and maybe the way it was rushed to be to be done or published or votes. Yeah, I really agree with this. Like, yeah, I talked to uh, to people uh, at some point uh, from uh, the World Health Organization, and uh, in particular, people at World Health Organization working on. Uh, AI and uh, applications of AI to, uh, to, to public health. And uh, this was uh, neglected. And right. they, people right. were not talking about I, I had, it. I had the same experiment exactly we do with the World Health Organization. And they tend to, like some of them still think in terms of television and newspapers. And, and they don't realize that like, if you want a vaccine, like a flu vaccination campaign to succeed, besides going to campuses and, and running ads in hospitals you actually have to try to have youtube and facebook on your side and mm -hmm. nudge people through their platform to just take the flu vaccine early in the year would have much larger effect. maybe they're doing it i hope but some of the interactions i had with with this well the few organi like the few interactions i had i could have from yeah. with, with the world health organization was, was the same feeling that uh, there's too much focus on on old media and uh, a lot of uh, overlooking like platforms are still not taken seriously like for, for them like YouTube is still for fun and entertainment and they, they still don't realize or maybe yeah. some of them still don't realize how much gains they could make for public health if they focus a lot of attention there yeah I'd say there are two different aspects of it like one of them is that uh, when people hear about AI's they really think that like, a lot of people, uh, from, from my uh, understanding, is they think mostly of uh, like diagnosis using some uh, machine learning algorithms uh, for like uh, imagery or whatever. Yeah, or robots for surgery. Or robots yeah. for they don't think of surgery. YouTube recommender systems. Yeah, and yeah, and they don't think as as this as something that has to do with health. Uh, yeah. and, and yet, like vaccination is a huge problem, uh, and information is key to good vaccination and information goes through uh, these social medias a, a lot uh, these days. And the other thing is that um, I f like, uh, the more I think about it, the more I feel like the, the biggest changes in, in, in health will be more and more about mental health, uh, or at least it's, it's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and yeah, in terms of mental health, uh, like information is, is critical and what information people are exposed to on a daily basis is critical. And again, like uh, social media have a key role. To yeah, and let me know if I'm wrong, but I thought there were studies about uh, detecting a depression from uh, mouse movements or scrolling patterns yeah. of people. So if this platform can, with higher accuracy, detect uh, depression and help the people that are yeah. in it, it but still, uh, this is not easy, well, this yeah. is a field where it, it's a bit uh, it's a bit complex because you might you might have uh, yeah you might from starting from a good intention have have side effects that are even mm -hmm. worse than your okay. Yeah. Does yeah. They need to be vocal? <laughs> sure, so, but, yeah. that, but there are like other subfields of public health where we could already have an easy discussion, like mm -hmm. the seasonal flu. Okay. Like the seasonal flu could like m many improvements could be done. Like uh, thousands of lives go each year because of the seasonal flu and, yeah, and hundreds of thousands. Uh, and then, yeah, sorry, like, thousands like a regional. Yeah. <laughs> talking yeah. like regional national uh, scale. And um, and the, the seasonal flu vaccine is something people still don't think of as a necessity, and or if just a larger fraction of us took this mm -hmm. this flu, the spread would be much more controlled and much 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 more lives would be saved each year. And so there are like fields where like you, you can already have an easy discussion, and then of course you can go beyond and and to more more complex public health concerns such as mental health. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, for, for mental health, I think uh, these are very encouraging paper, uh, but I think it's harder, so we also need uh, a lot more research to be done to understand what, it, what treatment, uh, like what kind of videos to propose that is going to be robustly beneficial for, for the health of the mental health of the user. This is very difficult, 
Unfortunately, we lack data about this. And mm -hmm. if we want to get more data, we're going to have to run experiments on people because fortunately we don't have the, the means to simulate yeah. people so far. Uh, this is where the oversight, the oversight of <laughs> the oversight of public health agency is necessary because nobody wants a private company to, to run and, and mm -hmm. even the even the company itself, Facebook itself would would refuse this, this responsibility. Yeah, yeah, it's, and it's like it, too big of it, there's a necessity to have some oversight from public health authorities if you want to over to, to undertake these kind of experiments. Or, or just like oversight for what's already happening. Just the testing that is routine testing, as I said, being done on the algorithm should have some oversight. Yeah, so I'm going to end with the call to medical doctors or people. Like, there are huge opportunities and things to investigate, especially if you want to do research about this. Uh, and I think there's a, a lack of it right now. So, yeah, that's one area of impact to design more robust and beneficial algorithms. <laughs> Thanks for watching uh, or listening. I uh, hope this was uh, productive and it would make you think even if you maybe disagree with what we've said and uh, yeah, we're going to welcome also uh, like, uh, criticism of what we said, I think it's a difficult topic. Uh, next week we're going to uh, discuss uh, something uh, related uh, to, uh, to this, we're going to talk more about the long-term effects of, uh, of exposure to different kinds of uh, information, and especially in the context of, uh, of algorithms uh, and the internet. Uh, and uh, until then, I hope, uh, well, I hope you're going to be here uh, next time and uh, we'll see you.